Welcome, the three of you. Welcome. Really lovely to see you all. Um, so what I've asked uh, each of the poets to do is to... I've asked them to uh, read a poem that they're, that they, that's influenced their life and work. Yeah. So first of all, I'm going to ask Anthony to read the Larkin poem that he's um, chosen, and then I'm going to ask him a bit about that choice. I've chosen the trees, and I'll say a couple of words about it afterwards. The trees by Philip Larkin. The trees are coming into leaf, like something almost being said. The recent buds relax and spread. Their greenness is a kind of grief. Is it that they are born again and we grow old? No. They die too. Their yearly trick of looking new is written down in rings of grain. Yet still the unresting castles thresh in full-grown thickness every May. Last year is dead, they seem to say. Begin afresh, afresh, afresh. Larkin um, wrote that in his notebook, completed it on the 2nd of June, 1967. And immediately afterwards, he wrote in that notebook, birthday of T. Hardy, 1840, bloody awful tribe. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote to his great friend, Monica Jones, uh, when he'd finished it and sent a copy, can one write this sort of poem today? But he did. Mm. Mm. So let's say, say, say a bit about why you've chosen him, because I, you, and you were a friend of Philip Larkin, weren't you? Yeah, he was a great friend. And uh, one of his literary executors. I mean, mm. it's part of my responsibility to see to the publication of his works. Um, it, it's a poem that I'm very proud to have published, like quite a lot of Larkin's poems. It was when I was literary editor of the weekly magazine, The New Statesman, that this arrived in the post. Imagine receiving that in the post and mm. being the first to, to read it. Absolutely marvellous. Mm. I was also the first one, when I was a radio producer earlier on, to broadcast the Wits and Weddings. Wow. Imagine receiving that. You know, I'd written to Larkin, who had been good at sending me poems for broadcast, uh, dear Philip, you know, I, I know I don't want to pester you, but could you send me another poem? And imagine receiving the wits and weddings through the post. Mm. Uh, this brand new poem. Hope it'll do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bit long. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Well, he was a, a tremendous poet. Um, well, what else? Uh, I mean, he's quite. He's, he's off. It's people. For some people, he's quite a controversial figure. I wondered. How did you find him as a man, and do you do you have a you know, sense of his controversy? I, I don't know; it's fairly controversial, but go on. Well, I mean, people often say he's right wing and bigoted and all that sort well, of. Well, yes, I suppose he was further to the right than I am. I'm, I'm sort of left of centre. He was somewhere to the right of centre, not as far right as his father. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I wouldn't say that he had very progressive political opinions, you know. <laughs> uh, but I can think of quite a lot of poets of the past who didn't have progressive political opinions and we still read, mm. and with pleasure. Mm. Um, I think you're really asking, was he a nice man? I suppose so, yes. Yes, yes he was. Mm. Um, he was very nice. The family was very fond of him. I guess there are two daughters in the audience who remember him with pleasure. Mm. Remember him with pleasure, as there are, you know, not many of our friends of his have been as well remembered by them as mm. he. He was very good with children. Mm. That surprises people. Mm. Because you say, oh, no. Well, he, he wrote to one of his friends, you know, make sure the daughters are drugged before I come. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a joker, I mean, and entertaining. And. Uh, one always felt that he was prepared to, as it were, put himself out for one. Mm. There was a generosity about him, I thought. I mean, all these things run counter to 
the opinions which have gathered around him. And he, I mean, he did say, and he did say some rather controversial things, unpleasant things. I suppose he did, but actually not to me. Um, mm. He reserved uh, these opinions, which people don't like, for his right-wing friends, mm. such as Robert Conquest and Kingsley Amis. Mm. But he thought of me as a lefty, and uh, therefore didn't indulge in that. Mm. That's lovely, thank you. Thank you. He wrote to his mother every day. Didn't he? Yes, that book has just come out. Very yeah. well edited by James mm. Booth. Mm. Uh, it's, um, it's a fascinating book in a way. Sometimes one gets a bit bogged down, but it is, it is a book where, you know, he was had a sense of duty that he had to write to his widowed mother and keep her cheerful and so on. They're not, they're not the most magnificent. They're not the letters of Keats or, you mm. know, or even the best letters of Philip Larkin. Mm. But they show that he did have very strong feelings of, of duty towards looking after this mm. poor old widowed woman. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, Anne, I wanted to ask you to read the MacNeath. That was your choice. Well, I'm going to read a poem called Snow by Louis McNeese. I have to say, I came to this poem quite late. I came to Louis McNeese only after I came to England in the 1980s or so. Uh, and I was absolutely bowled over by this poem. Um, I'll read it and then say a word or two about it. The room was suddenly rich and the great bay window was spawning snow and pink roses against it, soundlessly collateral and incompatible. World is suddener than we fancy it. World is crazier and more of it than we think, incorrigibly plural. I peel and portion a tangerine and spit the pips and feel the drunkenness of things being various. And the fire flames with a bubbling sound for world is more spiteful and gay than one supposes. On the tongue, on the eyes, on the ears, in the palms of one hand, of one's hand. There is more than glass between the snow and the huge roses. Mm. Now, why is that so satisfactory? Well, in the first place, I'm very much, I'm very fond of poetry that says things. <laughs> what uh, Frost, Robert Frost called the sound of sense is very important to me. And I think that poetry that doesn't come out and make itself clear in some way of, of, of what it's actually saying is a mistake. <laughs> I don't like obscurity for obscurity's sake at all. But this goes further. This seems to say more than it actually says. And I, I recently uh, published a book called uh, About Poems and How Poems Are Not About. And what I meant was I, that it's not that poems are not about anything. It's just that you want poetry to say more than about. You want them to, mm. to say the feelings. The feelings are matter in poetry, the, the emotion. And you get the sense when lines like the drunkenness of things being various, suddenly this is what happens to people when you suddenly see that something is wonderful. Mm. We spend a lot of time in our daily lives just getting on with things and suffering through. And then suddenly you see something, suddenly you hear a bird, or you hear a piece of music, or you see these roses against the snow, and you say, isn't it amazing that the world exists at all? And I think that's the core of poetry for me, the sense of utter amazement. My last book was called Astonishment. And I haven't written the poem that really is the po title poem of that. Mm. I've tried, but it hasn't worked out. But anyway, it seems to me that this poem does somehow express that. Mm. 
Yeah, very much. This is quite striking because you, you shared a, an office with Louis McNeese. I did. For, uh, uh, for a few. A couple of years, I think it was. Mm. Yes. Mind you, a lot of the time was spent not with him in the office, but with him in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> that was the nature of the BBC in those days. I'm not like that any longer. And Louis is dead. Mm, indeed. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, Anne, was that uh, you, know, you were the first person to write a critical study of Elizabeth Bishop. Yes. I just thought, I wondered whether you might say about something, a little bit about what made you write that. that you've written two studies, I know, of Bishop, and you've also written a, a well-known um, biography of uh, Plath. Well, actually, that goes back quite far when I was a teaching assistant at the University of Michigan in 1960-something. I can't remember exactly the date, because dates just fly away into a mist for me. But um, uh, I was teaching assistant to a poet who named Radcliffe Squire, so I learned from him like very much. We read her poem called The Fish, and I just thought, oh, I've never read such a good poem. <laughs> it's a bit like, you know, suddenly you hit by something. And it was the same feeling. So I read everything that she wrote, and I uh, was asked by Donald Hall to write a book uh, on my favorite poet for the United States Authors Series, Poet Series, and I said, of course I would write on Elizabeth Bishop, but nothing had been written on her. So I asked uh, Marianne Moore, actually, I wrote to Marianne Moore and said, do you have <laughs> Elizabeth Bishop's address? And she was living in Brazil. And Marianne Moore said, I'm sure Elizabeth would be loved to hear from you. So I wrote to her and got a reply. And this was all during the 60s, late 60s. Uh, we had quite a long correspondence. Mm. And it's published now by Farrell Strauss in America. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, and I would say that my beginnings as writing poems myself had so much to do with that. Uh, first-hand sort of friendship with Elizabeth Bishop. She was a prickly person, but I suppose we're all prickly people <laughs> in, that, in that way. That was good. She was prickly, hmm. and she didn't uh, say, oh, yes, it's nice, you know, it's nice you like to write poetry or anything like that. Hmm. She was critical, and I was critical. And, <laughs> and I was critical of her, and at the end... Um, I don't think she liked the book I wrote very much, but I do. I think it's a very good book. I'm amazed at myself. I'm only 30 or something. <laughs> but I, I think I got something she didn't know about herself, and that's what a mm. critic does. You, mm. don't, you don't expect to know everything about yourself. Mm. So that, I was going to read One Art by Elizabeth Bishop, mm. but then I thought, well, I'm, you know, I've done a lot with Elizabeth Bishop, and Louis McNeese is a new voice and a new way of looking. So I will read this poem. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anne. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. So, Peter, you, you've chosen uh, uh, Walter to the Mayor. So. I have indeed. <coughs> Who, you could say, is an old voice and an old <coughs> way of looking. Mm. Uh, but none the worse for that. I was brought up on peacock pie, was the mayor's peacock pie. Um, I remember being smuggled in an, an Oxford scholar's gown, which I had no justification for wearing, <laughs> into the show known in at Oxford to hear W.H. Auden huh? give his inaugural lecture. And uh, he said at one point in the lecture, and I thought, oh, snap. Um, I was very lucky when I was young because I was given that incredible anthology, Come Hither, uh, by Walter de la Mer, um, and it had a huge effect upon me. And I would say the same. Uh, so what I'm going back to in reading this particular poem is poetry which has whatever romantic flaws it may seem to have now, that sense of melody, incantation, spell, which meant a great deal to the Mayor, and which I still think if we get very, very far away from in poetry, uh, we, we've lost something. Mm. And another reason for reading this poem <laughs> is because it was the first poem I ever learnt by heart, um, 
so I'll try to recite it now, although I have it in front of me if I need it. Um, <laughs> and that would probably be at the age of about 15 or 16, quite irrespective from what people at school made one learn. And heavens above, uh, being born in 1933, I was brought up in the, the most re incredible romantic tosh <laughs> uh, at school. Um, but this isn't tosh, and it's simply called Farewell which is, in a way, uh, Walter Lemaire's message to himself and the world to keep looking at it. Um, farewell. When I lie where shades of darkness shall no more assail mine eyes, nor the rain make lamentation when the wind sighs, how will fare this world, whose wonder was the very proof of me? Memory fades. Must the remembered perishing be? Oh, when this my dust surrenders hand, foot, lip to dust again, may these loved and loving faces please other men. May this rusting harvest hedgerow still the traveller's joy entwine, and as happy children gather posies once mine. Look thy last on all things lovely, every hour. Let no night seal thy sense in deathless slumber, till to delight thou hast paid thy utmost blessing. Remembering all things thou wouldst praise, beauty took from those who loved them in other days. For me it's been a, some kind of, I suppose Arnold would have called it a kind of touchstone, mm -hmm. remembering to look at things because they're all passing, um, as we were just quoting in the in the room before. Man's mm. in love, and love's what vanishes. What more is there to say? Mm. Well, one of the things that poets do say is, let me put salt on the tail of what is vanishing mm. and mm. hold it there just for a little longer. Mm. Um, even if we all live on a cooling planet, we're all doomed to a uh, total <laughs> extinction. Uh, a little bit of time for everyone and everything that was that made one sing to think about it. Mm -hmm. And the Delamere poem, with its archaisms, its inversions, all the things which made a great deal of Delamere's poetry difficult to respond to now, I still feel that in his farewell, as in certain poems in Peacock Pie and in his anthologies, he hit something that still can sing to people. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Thank you very much, Peter. That's great. So I want to turn now from uh, poets that you've been, the three of you have been inspired by and even provoked by, to to you. So I thought I'd start with you, Anthony. That you know, always know the, the best place into your lives. But one of the things I was struck by from the that your, your your the story I know of your life is you um, going to America as a child, um, being evacuated to America, and coming back on D Day, I think. Um, was it? No, I was in the middle of the Atlantic on D-Day. Well, that's still quite something. <laughs> <laughs> on an aircraft carrier, uh, a carrier, almost 14 years old. Why I, I was allowed, how I was allowed to come back, I don't know. I wanted to rejoin my parents in England and tell my aunt and uncle with whom I was living in America, and, and uh, it was fixed. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. When, what, when did you, when were you, were you evacuated? Is that what, what I was evacuated was by myself on a, a liner called the Samaria in June 1940. I was just 10 mm. and left my mother and father and uh, didn't see them again for four years. Mm. Became a little American, in fact, mm. uh, which meant that my education from then on for several years was. Well, they tried to make me catch up because, you know, the American educational system, certainly in the South, was so inferior to the English mm. that I, I mean, I hadn't done any of the things that my contemporaries had done. <coughs> no algebra, trigonometry, French, Latin, any of these things. Mm. Never caught up, really. <laughs> <laughs> Failed what was then called matric. Nobody remembers matric. <laughs> And what was it like? Can you remember the sort of going on that ship away when you were 10? Such a, it seems now for us. No, I remember being terribly happy running around with other boys who were by themselves. And, mm. 
arriving in New York a fortnight later with the seat out of my little trousers and greeting my aunt whom I couldn't remember and, and feeling perfectly happy. Mm. Like an adventure. It was an adventure, mm. yes. And, and what, what happened when you got back? Well, my parents gave me the chance of either going to a, a day school or boarding school, a boarding school where my father had been, I chose the boarding school. Mm. I suppose it was the right thing to do. It's all a blur to me, really. I wouldn't say that my memory of my childhood is, is, is terribly clear. I wasn't unhappy. I didn't have an unhappy childhood. But I didn't have these wonderful sort of spots of time, I would say, like right. Wordsworth or something. Mm. Mm. I've never been a... Well, I love Wordsworth, but I don't have these great recollections of the uh, mm. marvellous things. What? <laughs> Am I talking too quietly? <laughs> <laughs> My wife is saying, yes. <laughs> I thought there was a mic somewhere. That, that's recording you rather than... Oh, I see. It doesn't actually... Are people finding it difficult to follow what I'm saying? No. no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just your... Just... <laughs> <laughs> so let's move to you, Anne, because the question I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, your, your childhood in the US, and you were training to be a musician when you were playing the cello, I think, in the piano. Well, my childhood was what I would say ideal. I mean, I had the most wonderful parents, both of whom were sort of first generation, I hate the word intellectuals, but they, were, they had discovered that when they met in high school in Cincinnati, Ohio, that they were two people with similar tastes and they loved music and they loved poetry and they loved any, any kind of uh, dramatic art. And so I was brought up by my father and my mother, both of whom read aloud a great deal. Huh. And I think it was my father reading Victorian poetry, reading, well not, even not in Victorian poetry, more uh, Walter Scott's Marmion and the Lady of the Lake, mm. and all these stories, uh, Arnold's Sorrow and Rustum, which made me run upstairs and tower lest he killed his own son. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I found that I was writing poems myself, ballads, or mostly ballads, mostly narrative. Mm. And I think it was getting that I am big rhythm into me so early when I was about nine or ten that I have been unable to write poetry or think of poetry without thinking of sound and thinking of music. Mm. My father was also a fine amateur musician and uh, so uh, I was brought up thinking you had to be a musician and I was a pianist and then a cellist. I wasn't very good but that, of course, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're any good. It doesn't matter if my poems are good, really. But it was there, and it was given to me on a platter. Mm. And I didn't realize until I got out into the world that nobody else was like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just thought this is the way people were, mm -hmm. that they all read uh, poetry aloud. And we read lots of Shakespeare, of course. Yeah, your, fa family, really. your father was a philosophy professor, wasn't he? Was, wasn't he taught by Wittgenstein? Yes, my father was at Cambridge studying with Wittgenstein and with G. E. Moore, whom he much preferred, <laughs> uh, when I was born. And actually, Wittgenstein held me in his arms oh, when really? I was a very small baby. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't remember it. <laughs> Uh, but I have letters from Wittgenstein to my father, very generous letters, advising him not to go into philosophy. It was far too difficult for anybody to live a life of philosophy, and it was Wittgenstein. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but my father went into philosophy anyway, and he wrote a book called Ethics and Language, which has not left me because I think all the time of language. Mm -hmm. I think it was just in, in me to think of it. But mm -hmm. my mother, too, was a very... Uh, she was much more, I was much more influenced by her, uh, uh. by her history, by fiction, I mean by 
the time I was, I suppose, 18, 19, I read almost all of Dickens mm. and all of Jane Austen. And, and my mother just gave me these books mm. and I read them. <laughs> and my sisters did too, and we played them, and we, you know. Mm. So again, it was, a, it was, I had no idea that the world was full of, say, uh, people who like cheap, nasty things. <laughs> 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 anyway, I'm still an analysis and proud of it. <laughs> so, Peter, um, the question I was, with the area I was going to talk to you about, I'm struck by. Um, how much your own poetry is shadowed by war um, in, 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 an, uh, in your new collection um, in um, Borrowed Landscape. There's a, I think there's a, there's a series of poems about your father-in-law in the First World War. Yes, indeed, it is entirely shadowed by war. Not that I intend to read any poems tonight about war, mm. um, but I think that as a child, um, where Anne and Anthony had a, a very different kind of background from mine. Um, uh, I don't want to compete in the sort of rough childhood stakes. <laughs> it, wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't exactly rough, but it was uh, primitive with a depressive mother and a hard-working teaching father um, in uh, a house in Derby with the bombers going overhead all the time, uh, staying with my grandparents in Lincolnshire with um, the Lancasters going in and out, East Anglia with flying bombs, uh, the air war and the war was present all the time. I regarded schools as rough, and I think it also had uh, my background there, incomparable freedoms in that my parents didn't care a damn what I did in the holidays, so long as I brushed my hair and looked tidy at five o'clock when I was supposed to come home. <laughs> uh, so I could get as dirty and wander about um, in the fields as much as I liked. Um, the only times I noticed them severely interfering or when the next door neighbour gave me a loaded First World War revolver, they decided to confiscate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not unreasonably. Not unreasonably. <laughs> and when I came home with an incendiary bomb in the basket of my bicycle, they decided to put it in a bucket of water and call the police. Um, <laughs> otherwise, um, I was left to my own devices. Um, I think it's a difficult thing to get out of one's system that period, mm. because it was a black and white period. And mm. adults don't think in black and white. Mm. And one of the points about writing poetry, I think, is that one revises and rethinks. One has to keep faithful to the child one once was, but one isn't that child. Mm. I think it was either Sendak or Russell Hobe, and Margaret will remind me, who said, I am not the child I was, but I quite like to go into that garden sometimes, shake his hands, and ask him how he's doing. Mm. Um, I can understand that. Uh, mm. very much. Mm. But I do think that when you say war has haunted my childhood, yes it did, and of course the First World War too, um, because in my first marriage my father-in-law was Echt Deutsch uh, from a German family living in this country who all served in the British forces in the First World War. Mm. So I call the sequence a civil war, because mm. it was for them. They were fighting their own relations mm. and I won't say killing their own relations, uh, because they probably weren't. Two of them were in the medical corps, two in the infantry, and all survived the war. So in that sense, uh, war has always been the background um, to what does form one very much, one's earliest years. Yes. Um, because I was 11, 12 when the war ended, and I remember thinking to myself, I wasn't brought up on nice books. My parents had nice books, my father did, but he didn't bother to show me them. <laughs> I was brought up on comics, Rover, Champion, this kind of thing, <laughs> Rockfist, Rogan of the RAF, oh yeah, <laughs> he's okay, um, this, this kind of thing. But at the end of the war, I do remember my parents hiding from me um, the first picture posts and things, which showed the pictures of Belson, uh, mm. Auschwitz, Dachau, Mm. And my, my sudden realisation, this is nothing to do with any war I understand. Mm. This is a completely other thing. Mm. Feeling ashamed of myself, mm. looking at myself, wondering why I was looking at the pictures. Mm. And the whole thing suddenly becomes a kind of nightmare, which for a child can be enjoyable, mm. running around streets, picking up shrapnel, mm. running about wild. Mm. Um, 
but I have had to learn so much in writing mm. uh, to, mm. to temper this with other experiences. Mm. Yeah, indeed. But I think the haunting never goes away. No. Because what happens to you by the time you're 11, 12, 13, 14 is sort of irreducibly there. Mm. Um, and it will keep on bobbing up in different ways, mm. um, which will mean that things that I think I've entirely forgotten of that period could suddenly reduce me to tears or mm. make me tremble. Mm. And I don't know why any longer. I might have known once. Mm. Mm. But the emotions are there, even if the realian behind them has vanished. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I want to now try and talk to you about where, your own writing and when you started writing. I was wondering, um, Anthony, where, where, when you actually started writing poetry, um, and, and why, in a way? Um, I began through a school exercise, I suppose. I really loathed poetry until I was just 14. Especially De La Mer. De La Mer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was, I think, seven in Leeds, uh, Miss Copley came in one day and said, "Today," she put on a quite different voice, today we are going to do poetry. <coughs> Slowly, silently, now the moon walks the night in her silver shoon. <laughs> shoon? <laughs> What's all this? Rubbish. Uh, put me off for years. And then at the age of 14, uh, not long back from America, the English teacher um, read us some Anglo-Saxon riddles, both in the original in Anglo-Saxon and then in translations. And we were set for prep in the boarding school, to try to write an Anglo-Saxon riddle. Well, I was very fascinated by these things, and I wrote about six. And Ingram, the English master, said mine were by far the best. And immediately, I'm a poet. <laughs> <laughs> and I began reading poetry voluntarily and writing it, pouring it out. It was imitation of whatever I'd just been reading. Rupert Brooke, T.S. Eliot. When I was just 15, I discovered the wasteland. Nobody had told me about this thing. Amazing. And within a few weeks, I produced this poem, which we called Ginunga Gap, which in Norse mythology is the name for the chaos before the world began. And it's like a 16th <coughs> carbon copy of Eliot's Wasteland, <laughs> with notes at the back, <laughs> some of them in Chinese. <laughs> because I've been reading Ezra Pound as well. <laughs> and so it went on. Um, it took me a long time to, as it were, find my own voice. Mm. <laughs> but that's it. Mm. Now what do you want to ask? Me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know yet. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what about you? And you said something about... Well, I said, uh, you know, I began to write poems because it seemed to me the thing to do was to write poems. Mm. And... Uh, and uh, I was. I had. I should say that I learned almost nothing in school because I didn't. I think I was deaf even then. It didn't seem to me the teacher had much to say that was interesting. <laughs> so I used to look out the window and think my own thoughts. And sometimes I would write my own poems. This is a quite young child, and suddenly my parents realized that I was. Uh, not, for instance, getting any sums right in arithmetic. Well, who wanted to care about all those numbers? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was just my sense that uh, I think I was too independent. The school wasn't very good, and it was a, the first school I went to was uh, classes of 30, 40 children, and they used to, the boys used to throw spitballs and things. And the, the teacher just had to keep everybody quiet. Mm. But I found if I just was silent, looked out the window, and then went back to the end of the, uh, you know, uh, of the room, at the bottom of the room, I could read a book, and nobody would see me, and I would be there. <laughs> nobody would know it was happening. Well, finally, they caught on to me, and one of the teachers finally got me after school. Her name was Miss Coffey. <laughs> and Miss Coffey was very beautiful with dyed blonde hair and I fell in love with her and I would do anything for Miss Coffey. Thank goodness she told me how 
to, uh, she didn't explain that mathematics really made sense, but she did t teach me that I had to learn the times tables if I was <laughs> going to it through. And uh, then I went to a fancier school, and it, I still was the stupidest in the class. But uh, I, I thought, uh, finally, I finally I caught up, you know. I think my parents were probably to blame, really, because they'd given me so much at home, and I wanted to do what I was doing, and I wasn't interested in school. <laughs> So very odd, very odd. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I want to say, when I'm going to read later, uh, when we lived in New Haven, my father was teaching at Yale, uh, we uh, took in a family of English children as during the war, 40 to 42 or 3, I think mm -hmm. it was. And we had two girls living with us, and uh, a little boy lived up the street. And these English children came, and they, they entranced me. And I began reading a book called The Princess and the Goblin. I don't know, by George MacDonald. I don't know if anybody ever reads it now. Mm. The Princess and Curdie. And I pictured England as a place full of princesses, kings, and, and wonderful things, goblins and fairies, and... Uh, so I sort of felt a picture of England. I'm going to read a poem about this later, mm. because that English connection lasted all my life, mm. I think. If we hadn't been for the war, <laughs> mm. you know, and you were in America, you know, uh, it would have been a quite different childhood. Mm. Mm. And what about you, Peter? When did, when did you when did writing and writing I poetry? I think it was a terribly difficult one indeed. It was very difficult. Um, I regard my education basically as a kind of nightmare. Um, uh, Anthony says you learn nothing much in America. I learn nothing in this country. Uh, uh, I think uh, again, if you're going back to those particular years, nearly anyone of any sort of calibre in the teaching profession was either in the services. Mm. And the people who weren't had been dug out at the age of that I am now to dodder into the classrooms uh, and teach what they vaguely remembered having learnt in 1882. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no feeling of poetry mattering to me at school at all. Um, I do think that Dodo Mayer's come here that did matter to me, but it didn't make me want to write poetry. I always had a sense more when I was young nonsense and song. Um, I used to play my mother's old 1920s records on her wind-up gramophone in a quaint old Normandy town. Uh, you know, when you and I were 17, I loved the lyrics. My father sometimes, uh, who was a cultivated animal, but he used to stomp <laughs> around the house singing such important uh, lyrics as I'm looking for the Ogo Pogo to put him in the Lord Mayor's show. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a wedding in the stars between Miss Venus and Mr. Mars. <laughs> um, this sunk in quite deeply. <laughs> I thought, th this really does show what can be done with words. <laughs> um, I was saved like nearly everybody else who knows nothing at all by good English teaching in my sixth form. Uh, but curiously enough, what fascinated me most was a dreadful dragon of a French teacher who somehow got me through the equivalent of French A-level and made me fascinated by French poems. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I did was not write English poems at all. I wrote endless translations at the age of about 16 or 17 of Verlaine, Henri Jam, um, Rimbaud, etc., Painful translations, <laughs> really painful, <laughs> trying to get the meter and the rhyme right as they were in France. You know, not like Lowell's imitations or anything. <laughs> it wasn't actually a bad idea. And then when I somehow got to university, and I don't know how I did, and got to Cambridge, I decided to write a poem, and it was published in Granta. And the trouble is that when you do one thing, you have to do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and here, Anthony is to blame, because uh, when I left Cambridge, I didn't uh, have a literary life at all. I went racking off into Lincolnshire, teaching in a school there, um, 
with a little 1934 Austin 7, um, um, with several uh, young children. Uh, and I wasn't really thinking of poems, but I did keep writing odd things. And then all of a sudden I thought, I'd better send one of these away. And I sent it to the listener. And Anthony was the editor. <laughs> and he took the poem. From nowhere, um, because in those days, you didn't deploy anything, or your, your, you know, how you'd done with the creative writing classes. <laughs> you just said, Dear Sir, here are some poems for your consideration, and a stamped addressed envelope if you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's what you did. And Anthony, actually, who was at that time a good editor, took this from <laughs> this <laughs> means that you were only very good editor. Later, that. I declined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, was that what you did, though, was you wrote notes on what people said. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. That was, in other words, it wasn't just the editor has no use for them. Here's a slip. It's, I like this poem. I'm not sure why you tell me in the last line what you already told me in the first nine. Uh, but apart from that, uh, you know. 1964. 1964? Sorry? 1964. About 1964, yeah. Um, and that kind of, the odd bit of encouragement can do wonders. And most of life consists of accidents. You don't choose life. Things happen. Yeah. Uh, and I, I thought I might as well go on writing. <laughs> and then I couldn't see a very good reason for stopping. Look at you now. <laughs> uh, so, listen, I need to start to draw this to a close because I want to make sure there's lots of time uh, for you to read in the second half after a, uh, a cup of tea. But I just want to go round again and just finish off. You've got something to say. I just want to say that I'm <laughs> I remember sending a poem to encounter. You wrote back, I laughed like a drain at this, but it's not suitable because people will be hurt. <laughs> you, said, yes, sir. you said, I think I would love to publish it, but people, I can't even remember what poem it was, but I still remember the note. And that was a very good thing. Yes, it you, was. You were a good editor. It was a very Perhaps good thing. Perhaps somebody someday will thing. edit the collection notes. People might notes. be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to see it. Oh, we when I'm dead. <laughs> I don't know whether it was a good thing for Anthony, because I, uh, and John Merle, who's in the audience there, uh, ran a press for a long time, uh, publishing poetry, and uh, we couldn't help writing letters to people that we didn't, in fact, publish. But, of course, if you write one criticism of a poem you're likely to get a three-page letter back saying exactly what is wrong with your judgment, <laughs> why the poem should have been taken, and here are another seven. <laughs> I don't know whether that happened to you, Anthony. So let's... Let, let's um, I want to sort of finish, try and finish off this. I'd love to talk more, actually. So there's got, you've got so much to say. But I'd like to say, you know, after, after writing for so long, what, you know, what, why do you write, Anthony? Why, why you've written poems? And well, what, what is it for? Yeah. I haven't written a poem for um, almost 18 months. I've dried up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they'd be sort of sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> poor <It's> fella. Very <laughs> <laughs> uh, months. All very well. She, there's Claire Adcock. Uh, four years younger than me, that's all. It pours out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very good, too. <laughs> no, I have. I mean, it's not, I, I just seem to have uh, given up. Um, but there we are. Rest you know. on your laurels, for heaven's sake. That's what my wife keeps saying. Rest on. What laurels? I was, going to, I was going to swear, but mine shouldn't in this place. I know. I, I mean, I finished. Finished. <laughs> but what? 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 Do, what would you say? Because you've spent your life in literature and you know, publishing poets, um, teaching, teaching um, radio broadcast, writing. <coughs> you know, very substantial body of work. What, what's it for? What's poetry for? <laughs> no heckling. <laughs> I can't I just look at my face. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. It, it was a compulsion. Um, it was something I wanted to do well, and I think sometimes did well. It was important to me, and important to me also in the sense of other people's work. And nice mm -hmm. things have been said by Peter. Yes, I did take trouble when I was a radio producer and editor and so on, because I know what it's like, mm -hmm. this stuff pouring in with the stamped address envelopes. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I, I did send sometimes things back with just a rejection slip, but not often, I think. I usually wrote something or other, even if it was discouraging. Such as, why do you go on? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never did that. <laughs> what, 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 have you got anything to say about my terrible question, Anne? <laughs> <laughs> what is poetry for? Poetry oh, for? Question, you read my book called About Poems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my poem's not about... Uh, Poetry isn't for anything, as far as, I mean, what's anything for? I really, I think poetry is for the satisfaction of the poet, mostly, <laughs> because if you are a poet, I, my niece, a little girl, nine, the other day said to me, do you like being a poet, and I didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I suppose I couldn't help it. And so I think in a way, if you write poetry, if you find you have to write a poem, well, then you write a poem. Mm -hmm. But I don't think of myself as being a poet. Mm -hmm. I, I think of myself as being Anne, mm -hmm. with a family, mm -hmm. and I have all sorts of obligations. Mm -hmm. and. I just, I don't like the literary life. I, I simply don't like the competition. I don't like the feeling that one's going to get prizes. I think prizes are a mistake on the whole. Mm. I think what one writes a poem for is for the release of the pressure inside. And when you've finished a poem, don't you agree? You feel pleased with yourself. <laughs> I've done it, and it was very hard to mm -hmm. do. Yes, Larkin said, as if I'd laid an egg. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you're right. It's for. It, it really, and then if you can communicate to other people, well, that's very nice, and, you're, and, you, and, you, and you make friends, and then you make enemies, and then that's just uh, another thing. Hmm. So, you know, it's just... Like doing any art. Why do people paint? Mm. Why do people feel they can't get away without mm. painting? Mm. Why yeah. do people have to play music? I mean, it's just... Yeah. I think... You, know, you, you might say, why do people make cakes with can put candles on? I think <laughs> David Jones has a lot to say about this. Mm. It's the gratuitous act which human beings do. They make the unnecessary thing. Mm. Nobody could quite say poetry is necessary. Um, people have lived without it. Mm. Um, uh, Back to Auden again, notice this unpopular art which cannot be hung like wallpaper. It is fascinating, the difficulty of it is fascinating, mm -hmm. particularly if one's interested in uh, the technical business of poetry, um, which I am at times and have been very fascinated by, then uh, that is like uh, playing difficult exercises on the piano or something. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fascination of what's mm -hmm. difficult, as mm -hmm. some people would find it in playing chess. Um, I absolutely agree with Anne that I would never call myself a poet. I'm a Peter who writes poems. Um, if I had to say something about what I have come to feel, it's that every human being has a map in their head of territory. Certain territories which haven't been properly explored, which could perhaps be explored in poems. Um, some territories I have explored a great deal, like the First War and the Second War. Uh, like my parents' generation. Some territories inside anyone's head may be marked with danger signals. Here be lions. You go here at your peril. Um, I, I know this because, like most people, I've known horrible things, suicides and miseries of all kinds, and some things I feel I cannot quite cope with in poetry, mm -hmm. and I don't know whether that's cowardice on my part or mm -hmm. a sensible fencing off of what I would make a mess of if I tried to tackle it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that really, if I was pushed, I'd say it's an act of celebration. Mm -hmm. And if you feel yes. like celebrating, you must go on celebrating. Mm -hmm. um, yes, well, I think celebration is interesting, but so many poets, poems, as I was thinking when I looked through over mine before I came, so many of my poems are not about celebration, but about 
resignation. <laughs> yes. Somehow not having to celebrate, but not needing praise, not needing, not needing a certain kind of, I don't know, admiration and so forth, of being free of, I suppose being free back in nature, which is a very corny way of putting it, but, but when very, you very, feel that you're a part of something. Very often, something when like, I say celebration, uh, poets transmute um, all the appalling details of a death or something into a celebration mm -hmm. of a, 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 a life. Mm -hmm. When I wrote poems about my mother, she is not only the dying woman on the bed, she is the woman who did this, the woman who did that, mm -hmm. the 17-year-old the my father fell in love with. She is mm -hmm. a multiple composite which I'm celebrating, mm -hmm. although I'm not ignoring uh, the rawness and displeasing nature of being a physical animal and dying. Mm -hmm. um, but I think poetry can surmount that while at the same time encompassing it. I'd love to carry on more, but uh, we're going to have to stop there just for now. Uh, and then we're going to have, well, in a moment we'll go next door and have a cup of tea. Uh, and then we're going to come back and hear all our three poets reading. But we're going to hear some more from them. So let's just give them a really a wonderful <laughs>